All right, uh, you know, this was supposed to be a terrible hurricane season. That just shows you how much people know, right? Uh, we haven't seen anything, but I did come across this, and I thought it was good. Ten reasons why hurricane season in Florida is a lot like Christmas, all right? Number ten is this. You have days of anticipation for the big event. You drag out boxes, number nine, that haven't been used since last season. Number eight, last-minute shopping in crowded stores. Number seven, regular TV shows preempted for specials. Number six, you have family coming to stay with you. Number five, family and friends from out of state calling you. Number four, you buy food you would normally never buy in bulk you would never get. Number three, you have days off of work and school. Number two, lighting candles. And number one, at some point, you know you're going to have a tree in your house, all right? I thought that was good. And here's the deal. Even though we've not had any hurricanes hit this season, here's what I know. We've had a lot of storms hit, haven't we? I mean, I'm talking about those storms of life. I'm talking about those things that that, uh, will just really, we, you know, will hit us with all kinds uh, of pressure. And think about even if things have been going smoothly for you, Think about the storms that are going on in our country right now. The storm of the economy. Man, we have unemployment and underemployment. We have the national debt. We have uncertainty, a debt limit, all of those things that are going on. The storm of Washington, that there's gridlock that doesn't seem, in fact, it's a shame that it seems like in the last 11 days they've done their best work, right? Because <laughs> they've done nothing. And so that's been good. But but, you know, the, the, the storm of Washington and all that's happening there, the, uh, the storm of quickly fading values and morality uh, in our culture, you know, things that we would have been ashamed to talk about 10 years ago are now the focus of primetime TV shows and movies. And, and we see our culture continue uh, to degrade, and all of those things are going on. And so what I thought is, even though I've preached through this before, I thought, let's do it again, because let's talk about joy for the next six or seven weeks. Philippians is a manual for how to live with joy in your life. And here's what I want to say to you. If I were to ask you if you're joyous, here's my concern. Many people would define joy based on circumstances. You may say, yeah, I'm joyful because, man, right now there's no conflict, trials, tests, or hardships in my life. Everything's good. And what we're going to learn over these next six or seven weeks is that joy is not based on circumstances. In fact, if it's based on circumstances, it's truly not joy. That joy rises above circumstances. In fact, as we look at this book of Philippians, guess where Paul was when he wrote the book? He was in prison. By the way, if I ask where Paul was when he wrote any book, what's the best answer? In prison, right? So he's in prison. Now imagine this. He's in prison in Rome, and he writes a manual for joy. And and because Paul understood joy is not based on circumstances. So we're going to look at at this dinky little book. In fact, that's the official theological uh, definition of this book. It's a dinky little book. It's four chapters, 104 verses, and yet in those 104 verses, 16 times, Paul commands us to be joyful or to rejoice, letting us know that there should be joy in our lives. In fact, joy is a theme throughout the Bible. Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. He said he gets his strength from the joy that he finds in the Lord. The Psalms and Proverbs are full with verses on joy. When you get to the New Testament, remember when the angel announced the birth of Jesus, he said, today I bring you good news of great, oh, y'all are asleep, right? Let's say that again. Good news of great joy. That's right. That shall be for all the people. In fact, when you, John chapter 15, Jesus says that, he says this, he says, obey my commands that my joy uh, may be in you and that your joy may be complete. One of the things we'll see over these next six or seven weeks is you will never know full joy without full surrender, without full obedience as best as you can, being led by the Spirit to God's uh, commands. And then Galatians talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Most of us could quote those. The fruit of the Spirit is love, what? Joy, peace, patience, kind. In fact, I heard a great sermon. I'm sticking with this one. He said this, the fruit of the Spirit is love. 
but it manifests itself by joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, self-control. And joy is the first one listed there. So joy is the theme of the book of Philippians. And we get that from the, the, uh, the verse that I put in your notes, Philippians 4.4. 4. Look at what it says. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord when? Always. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I love this. It's like, just in case you didn't get it, let me tell you again, right? Rejoice in the Lord always. By the way, I'll say it again. Rejoice. It's sort of like he's wanting us to to really get this. So as we look at this, let's break down each chapter real quick. The first chapter deals with joy and living. You're going to see that you can live in a way that that you have joy that rises above the circumstances in your life. Secondly, chapter 2 is joy in serving. In fact, you will never have joy unless you're serving others and following the example of Christ. For some of you, maybe the thing that's keeping joy out of your life is that you're not serving others. Third is joy and purpose. Paul talks about pressing on toward the prize to win the goal. We're going to see that God in chapter 3 has uh, a joy and purpose, which actually says joy and sharing up there. Okay. Uh, So joy and sharing also. And and we'll see that. And then uh, chapter 4, joy in resting. That you don't have to carry the pressures of the world on your shoulders. There is a way to rest in Christ and to know his joy. So let's look at Philippians chapter 1 starting in verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons. Paul wanted to make sure everybody understood this message was for them. All the saints and all of the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I what? Remember you. If you write in your Bibles, write Acts 16 right next to the word remember. We're going to get back to that. Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with what? Joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. In your notes, what's the key to joy? Well, verse Verse 6 tells us confidence is the key of joy. In fact, you will never have joy without confidence. But here's what we need to understand. The confidence isn't in your ability. The confidence isn't in your talents. The confidence is not in your bank statement. The confidence is what? The God who began a good work in you is going to continue working in you until the day of Christ Jesus. That's the confidence that brings us joy, that the God who started the work in our lives is going to continue to work in our lives to bring about his glory and our joy. And it's only when we have confidence that God is sovereignly in control of everything that we will ever experience joy. And so confidence is the key to joy. We're going to learn that there's a way to have confidence that produces joy even when relationships are strained. There's a confidence that produces joy when you've been downsized and the money is tight. There is a confidence that produces joy whenever your health is suffering. There is a confidence that produces joy even when you're struggling with sin that you just can't seem to break. That there is a confidence that produces joy. And Paul's going to talk about that in the book of Philippians. In your notes, three principles for building that confidence. The first is this, opposition will come, expect it, and expect God to use it. Opposition's gonna come, expect it, and expect God to use it. Let me show you where I get that from, what we're talking about. Remember in verse three, he said, I thank my God every time I remember you. What was he remembering? Well, he was remembering when he was there and planted the church at Philippi. And we find that in Acts chapter 16. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 16 and starting in verse 12. And notice what Paul says. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and a leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there for several days. This is Paul's second missionary journey. He's with Silas and he's strategically picked Philippi. Why? Well, it's a very important city. Philippi was named after Philip II, who was the father of Alexander the Great. 
Uh, Philippi is in now present-day Greece. It was a Roman capital, 800 miles away from Rome. It also was a place where gold was found, and so it was an affluent city. And Paul and Silas went on their missionary journey to establish the gospel and to establish a church in Philippi goes on verse 13 on the sabbath we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer we sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there one of those listening was a woman of the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. Now that tells us everything we need to know about Lydia. Purple cloth was a very expensive cloth. And so, so Lydia, the fact that she was a dealer in purple cloth meant that she was very affluent. She was upper class. And, uh, and so she's out there with these women. And it says she was a worshiper of God. She knew God. She worshiped God. But understand this. She didn't have the whole story yet. She had not heard the story of Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul and Silas are there. So it goes on to say, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. He shares the gospel. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us into her, to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. And the church was born in Philippi. And everything's going good until you get to the next verse. And things start going downhill really quick. Verse 16, once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. Now, Lydia was upper class, a dealer in purple, and now Paul and Silas encounter a slave who's demon possessed uh, and, and is at the bottom rung of the social ladder. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said in the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope for making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or to practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. Look at verse 23. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, don't look ahead. Let me ask you this. What would your mood be like right about now? What would your demeanor be like right about now? You've, you've, ex you've cast a demon out of a lady, but because she was a fortune teller and, earn it, and a slave and earning money for her masters and they've lost their income, they bring you before the officials. All the town sees an uproar. They come and join in. And, and the, the officials say, well, man, we can get a little political uh, brownie points here. So they had Paul and Silas severely beaten and thrown into prison. Now, what would your attitude be like at that moment? Well, let's look. Verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and what? Singing hymns to God. Now, we don't know what they were singing. I know if it was me, I'd have been singing, nobody knows, right? I mean, it would, have been, it would have been terrible, but that's not what they were singing. They were singing praises to God. How in the world do you sit in a prison cell at midnight after you've been severely flogged for casting a demon out of a poor young lady and sit there and praise God? Here's the deal. Paul knew the secret of joy. See, he didn't have happiness because happiness is based on happenings. But what he had is joy, because joy rises above circumstances. And we're going to see why in just a few minutes. So it says that they were singing hymns to God, and notice this, and the other prisoners were listening to them. They were a witness for God in the middle of a jail cell, in the middle of the night, in Philippi. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors were open, and everyone's chains fell loose. In your notes, here's a great principle to remember. One of the keys to joy is this, praise. 
Man, if you want the chains of discouragement to drop off, praise God. Learn how to live a life of praise. If you want the, the chains of, of worry and anxiety to fall off, learn to praise God in all circumstances. Paul and Silas are sitting in the middle of prison, and they're praising God, and the chains fall off. Now look at verse 27. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. Here's the deal. Why was he going to kill himself? Because if he didn't do it, then his boss was. Because if you were a jailer and you lost a prisoner, it was at your life. It cost you your life. And so I'm sure he thought, man, it's going to be a lot simpler and easier and less painful if I just go ahead and do it as opposed to them killing me. And notice verse 20, 28, but Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. What? We are all here. Now, can you imagine that? There was something about Paul and Silas's prayer service in the middle of the night. There was something about the way they were praising God, the, the way that they had joy in the midst of those circumstances, that when everybody else could have walked out, they stayed. And we don't know the whole story. Maybe Paul said, guys, come on, stay here for a little. Maybe they were still so mesmerized by Paul and Silas, they just couldn't, didn't even think of leaving. But whatever, they're all there. And look at verse 28. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Let me say this. The most important question anybody can ever ask right there. What must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Do you ever notice how easy that was? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. We understand this is not just an intellectual belief. It's the kind of belief where we give our lives uh, to Christ. And, and he brought them out. Uh, um, I'm sorry, verse 32. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was now filled with what? Joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Here's the principle in your notes. When you know opposition will come and you expect God to use it, it will give you stability and maturity. It will give you stability and maturity. You see, if you believe some of this garbage out there that once you become a believer, all your problems go away and you're going to prosper and everything's going to be great, then as soon as life happens, man, you're going to fall apart. But if you understand that God, uses, God is working all things out, remember what he said, the confidence comes from the fact that he is continuing that work in your life. And no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in, God is still working all things out for his, joy, for his uh, glory and our joy, that he is still working, then you can have confidence which brings stability and maturity in your life. Let me explain it this way. I do a lot of premarital counseling. And so they'll come in, and you know how, you know, the 20, young 20-year-olds, 20 and they're all, you know, lovey-dovey and can't, you know, let go of each other, and they sit across from me. And one of the things I always say is, now understand this, there will be tough days ahead. In fact, every wedding I do, I say there are going to be good times, but there are also going to be some tough times. And, and so when, I, when that couple's sitting across from me, and, man, they're all, you know, in love, and I say, yeah, there's going to be some tough times down the road. And they go, oh, Pastor Chuck, we know that's true for most couples, right? But we are so in love. We've met our soulmate. Nothing bad could ever happen in our relationship. Can you say naive, right? I, I mean, if they sit there and they don't think that there's ever going to be dark days, ahead, then they're headed for a train wreck. But if that young couple sitting across me say, you know what, we know. We know that life happens, that things happen, that, that we're two different people and that right now opposites attract, but somewhere down the road's opposite attack, right? You know, we know all that stuff. Then I'm saying, boy, they have a foundation for a good marriage because they know that opposition, that tough days are ahead. In the same way, in our spiritual walk, if we know that opposition comes and we can expect it and we can expect God to use it, that's why James says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. 
minds because God is going to use that in your life to bring about stability and maturity in your life. Back to Philippians, uh, look at the second truth, and that's this, how to build confidence. Understand this, that God finishes what he starts, so trust him. That's verse 6 again, being confident in this, that you began a good work and you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul is writing to these Philippian believers and he's saying, look, tough times will not stop God's work in your life. In fact, I'll say this, the only thing that will stop God's work in the life of a believer is the believer. You have a choice when tough times come. You can choose to trust God through it and grow through it, or you can choose to sit back and complain. And and here's the promise that God has is that the work that he started, he will carry it on to completion. If we believe he's sovereignly in control and we trust him, then in your notes, knowing God finishes what he starts will give you hope. So here's the deal. I don't think Paul and Silas understood how God was going to work when they were having that midnight worship service in the prison cell. But here's what I do believe. They knew that God was going to work because they had been walking in obedience and they refused to give in to uh, discouragement and they chose to praise God in the midst of all that they were going through and they knew, they had the hope that God was going to do something great through that and he did. Not only did they influence the other prisoners but the jailer and his whole household and the kingdom grew and the church of Philippi grew because they understood this principle that God finishes so trust him and that gives us hope. And then thirdly, relationships Relationships provide encouragement, so build them. Relationships provide encouragement, so build them. And I think in these verses, he gives us three keys to build fantastic relationships. The first one is this, be grateful for the good in people. Notice what Paul said in verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you. Paul uh, models this throughout his letters of being grateful for the good in people. When he writes to the church at Thessalonica, he says, I thank God for the love that you display. When he wrote to the church at Corinth, he says, I thank God for your flexibility. And he was constantly thanking God for the good in people. Let me just say this. As your pastor, I don't get to say this enough, but I want to thank you for the church that you are. Now, I mentioned at the beginning, man, we have gone through some storms, even though we haven't been hit by a hurricane. But if you think of the last several months, we've had a campus pastor resign. We've had our beloved mission pastor go to be with the Lord. And then Troy comes and says to me, our downtown campus pastor, that the American Bible Challenge called, and I have to be out there riding this season along with the Tournament of Champions, and I'm going to be gone for nine weeks. So in the midst of that, over the last three or four weeks, uh, uh, we have just been going through it through a storm. In fact, and here's what I want to thank you. The elders, the deacons, many of you have stepped up and said, anything I can do to help, let me know. Next week, we're going to start having our small group leaders close this service so that during this time, we get to know each other a little bit better. And I want to thank those who stepped up. Here's the deal, man. God is working in the midst of that. Last month, we had at the downtown campus our largest membership class ever. We didn't know how we were going to fit them all in a room. Today, if everybody shows up, we'll have our largest membership class uh, at the Lakeside campus since the merger. And by the way, membership class, if you want to know more about the church, what we believe, become a part of the church, join us right after this. We're going to serve you lunch. I think it's Ruth's Chris. I'm not sure, all right? But we're going to serve you lunch. We have child care that will take care of your children. We're going to feed them pizza and all of that. Be about an hour and a half, two hours. Love for you to join us right after this. Learn more about the church. It is an information class. We're not going to twist your arm, make you join. But love for you to come find out more about the church. Last weekend, Between the students who were baptized last Wednesday and last weekend, we baptized 27 people in one week. And God is moving in our church. I want to thank you for all that you're doing. Here's the best emails I ever received. I receive these emails every once in a while. I love them. 
Pastor Chuck, I've invited my neighbor or my coworker to come to church this week, and they're coming with me, so don't blow it, right? I love that. I love that email, man, you know, because they get it. It really is about us inviting our friends. I want to thank you for your faithfulness financially. Man, in a down economy, in about three or four weeks, we're going to open up a children's building. We're going to celebrate what God's doing, and so I want to thank you for that. Let me ask you, when's the last time you told your spouse how grateful you were for them or your kids or your co-workers how grateful you were for them? Second thing Paul models is this, practice positive praying. Look at verse 9. Here's Paul speaking. He says, and this is my prayer. He's telling the church how he prays for them. In fact, I've written this down on three by five card. This is how I'm praying for our church. He says this, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Is that a powerful prayer or what? And now, I was even thinking about that. Would that be a powerful prayer to pray for our kids? Think about this. God, I pray that my boys would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, that they would be able to discern what's best and pure and blameless for that day, that they would be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. A powerful prayer. And Paul practiced praying for his church, uh, this powerful prayer. I heard Chuck Swindoll tell the story uh, of a lady in his church who practiced positive, specific praying. She had finished college, she had established a career, and she wanted to get married and have children. And so what she did is she decided she was going to pray real specific about this each night. And she went out and she bought a pair of men's blue jeans and put it at the foot of the bed. And this would be her prayer every night as she went to bed. Father in heaven, hear my prayer and grant it if you can. I've hung a pair of trousers here, now please fill it with a man. That is powerful praying. And then I heard... Uh, Chuck Swindoll says that a couple weeks later, one of his deacons came up to him and said, now, pastor, I wasn't here a couple weeks ago, but my teenage son was, and you said something in that sermon, and he went out and bought a bikini and put it at the edge of his bed, right? I don't know what that's about, but you need to let me know. Practice positive praying. And then lastly, Paul says, be patient with people. Be patient with people. Verse 7, it's right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart. Have you ever noticed that those people closest to you are either in your heart or on your nerves? I mean, let's be honest, right? The ones that are closest to you, they're either in your heart or on your nerves. So how do you move them from being on your nerves to in your heart? Well, you pray for them. You pray for them. You thank God for the good that's in them. You pray positively for them. You have patience with them. And you understand this, that the same God who is working all things out for, uh, in your life is working those same things out in their lives. Paul goes on in verse 8. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. You love them through Christ. And in your notes, relationships based on God's love will give you strength. So how do you have confidence? Well, look, let's look at these three three things. If I know opposition will come, expect it and expect God to use it, that gives me stability and maturity. If I know that God finishes what he starts and I trust him, that brings hope in my life. When I build great relationships, then that brings strength to my life. And those three bring confidence in my life that he who began a good work is going to carry it on to the the day of completion. And when I believe that, that will produce joy in my life. Jesse, come and close our time together.